Well, thanks so much for getting in touch about this. I mean, you, you know what we're yeah. trying to do. We're, you know, we're putting together this podcast you know, to hear from people about how they're getting on with this sudden uh, responsibility everybody was being given to sure. look after their kids at home and to, and to take care of their education. And, uh, you know, we're doing a series of them, probably about six all told, you know, where we'll take different themes each time. And we're also very keen to, you know, to cover a whole range of different places you know, in situations, because, you know, some people are living in tenement buildings in the inner city. Some people are sure. out in the suburbs, you know, some people have got three or four kids, some have got one, you know, so it's all very different. But we're right. really stuck, and, and, and also by what you were saying about this relationship you've got with the, the charter school, at the moment. but we'll come on to that anyway. It, it could, but could you just tell us, I mean, where are you in, are you in a house, in an apartment? Are you? We're, we're in a home. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In, in the city or outside? So we, we're in a, we're in the city. We're in a small, so I'm not right downtown Salt Lake. I'm, I'm more south of Salt Lake in a city called Lehigh. Oh, yeah. And we're, yeah. I'm, I'm in, yeah, we're right in, in Lehigh. Yeah. And how many children have you got at home? I have four. So I have, they're all five years apart. I have a, a college student, so she's 21. And she's at, at home now um, going to school locally. And then uh, I have a 16-year-old or sophomore in high school. I have an 11-year-old, a fifth grader, and a uh, six-year-old, a kindergartner. That's quite a spread, isn't it? Yeah. 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 It Although, wasn't intended that way. It just sort of happened that way. But I know. It, it does worked. work out that way. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And I was saying earlier, I'm one of seven children. Oh, My wow. It's a long time ago doesn't. now. But uh, there comes a point where, you know, mass catering mass takes case. on its own kind of momentum. Sure. You know, when, you, when you reach that number of people. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, are you also working? I am. So I, I was actually working at a school um, just prior to the school closures. So I was working at a school part time and I'm also in the process of um, launching a, a side business. I'm, I'm going to school part time myself as well. Yeah. But, but in the meantime, um, you're faced with this immediate challenge of... <laughs> having the kids at home and, and educating them. Yes. How, yeah. how, have you, how have you found that and how are you, how are you facing it? Well, as you know, because I submitted the, the letter to you <laughs> that That's I wrote to my letter. children's yeah. school board. <laughs> yeah. Um, it is, it's been incredibly defeating for my family. So um, with, from the what? time that I found out that we were moving online, um, I mean, we were in, initially faced with the challenge of, all right, well, my husband works from home. I work from home. We have two laptops and I have, you know, my daughter, my college student has, has a laptop, but I have three children that are now expected to be online half the day on their own laptops. And so we scrambled a little bit with, with that challenge. Thankfully, the school later on in the week determined that, that there were so many families that shared that same um, limitation that uh, they started renting out their, their Chromebooks. So we got all the kids on their Chromebooks, which then poses another challenge, which <laughs> is that I think an age old fight that, that parents fight to keep their kids off electronics. And now we're encouraging them to be on electronics half the day because it's the only way that, that they're able to learn right now in, this, yeah. in, in the environment, at least in terms of the expectations of the individual schools. And that's our school's expectation, right? So. So there's that. And then within a two week period, I had, I counted over 70 school related emails from administrators, from board members, from individual teachers. I mean, you know, in high school, those, the children have eight different teachers. Yeah. Um, so then you take those emails and collectively 13 different teachers that have all have different expectations. They've been given carte blanche on, on how they want to run things. So I've got some teachers saying, hey, I'm going to sign things on Monday, and then I want to do on Friday. Other teachers saying, let's follow the A-day, B-day schedule. I'll assign it on A-day, turn in your work on the the next A-day. Other teachers just randomly assigning things with different due dates and trying to keep track of everyone's individual expectations, all the different websites they're supposed to be on, the different logins, um, how they like to explain their work, how they like to post their work, um, how they, they like to receive the work. Yeah, I mean, even my my kindergartner is expected to be on five different websites every day, working from five different websites. Doing what? Um, 
So she has a math website. She has um, kind of a mixed website that she's on. She's got a reading website, two reading websites that she's supposed to be on. Um, and then she's just got to cut another website that is just overall um, fluency activities. Mm -hmm. And with a with a kindergartner, I mean, you have to be right by there. They don't they don't understand really how to navigate all the different websites, and they they certainly don't read well enough to understand the assignments and and to try to understand where what they're supposed to be clicking on every time. So that in itself, I'm, I mean, I'm glued to her hip for several hours every day, just helping her navigate that. So the expectations seem very unrealistic. It's, as you probably know, um, a lot gets lost in text and there's been, a, there's a lot of misunderstandings. And so we're, we're doing the best we can to juggle all of this, but it's, my children don't seem to be thriving in this environment on top of all, you know, the, the fear and, and, and the uprooting of their routines. Um, but in addition to that, trying to keep them engaged is an entirely different set of challenge, challenges. I mean, there's only so many hours you can click boxes, you know, every day. So it's, it's posed a, a, a unique challenge for us, certainly. And then um, seeing Fs all of a sudden pop, all, pop up all over my kids' report cards is, is maddening <laughs> yeah. during this time, right? But just go back to the beginning here a minute. What, what's the school board said to you? Are they saying that you've just got to carry on doing everything that they were being taught at school? You've just got to do that at home and carry on as if there was no pandemic and no lockdown. So you're in charge now. Their messaging is, is lenient. In practice, I'm not seeing the leniency in terms of, I mean, I'm getting a lot of messages saying, hey, do the best you can, but then I'm seeing my, my son is not a student that gets Fs and now I'm seeing Fs pop up every day and I'm having to email teachers. Now, I will give the teachers credit because when I email them and say, hey, what's going on? My, my son has no idea why he failed. He's getting an F. You know, they'll say, oh, well, there was a misunderstanding on the assignment, but looks like the whole class misunderstood it. So I'm going to be remo removing the Fs from the grades. <laughs> but I mean, they're, they're leaning in terms of when you reach out to them. Um, they'll make some adjustments. So they're flexible that way. But I also don't have the time to be reaching out to that many teachers on a daily basis because we're getting missing assignments or, or we're getting a poor grade on something or there's just, there's so much room for error in, in the current setup. Are you in touch with other parents in the school? Uh, I am. And um, I'm also in touch with other parents outside of our school. And it sounds like everyone collectively is running into some challenges. I mean, different parents are taking different approaches. Some parents are just saying, you know what, we're just going to survive. I'm just going to let these grades go um, and we're going to survive. But, you know, for a high school student, that's on his transcript. So, you know, I, that's, that's a tough tightrope to walk for me. Um, so that's, that's been... There's been some collective sentiment around frustrations. Now, when I sent that letter to the board, they did read it at the, the public board meeting, the virtual board meeting that they held, and, and they read it, and, and in close, they said, well, that was one parent's response. Now, let's move on to budget, and that's, maybe that's how they run it, but I haven't heard anything back. However, um, it, it, I, I would love to, to to offer at some point if it comes up uh, and it, it makes sense a salute what I believe to be a solution I my, my fifth grade my fifth grader her her teachers have kind of co-created a system that I actually think is working um, actually, and I believe it to be go ahead I'm sorry Judge, before we get to that the solution yeah. for yes. people listening to this who haven't read your letter what, oh yes what, what was the what, what was the kind of main theme of the letter I've read it, but yeah. So um, the theme of the letter was essentially just look. I appreciate all you're doing, and I'm certainly not criticizing. I know everyone is absolutely doing the best they can. I mean, teachers are in the same boat, right? They all had to yeah. throw something together very quickly, and this is this is new methodology for them as well. This is a new format for them. So, I mean, I do believe everyone's doing the best they can. But my, the point of the letter was, hey, while we're in evolution phase. Um, I would like to offer some feedback so as we grow together, we can make some adjustments. I'd like to let you know what's not working for my family. Yeah. What's not working for my family is multiple different websites. 
um, people, teachers working in a vacuum and having carte blanche to kind of run it how they want, especially when you're working with numerous teachers and they're all over the board, the, the expectations are, are hard to one, understand and, and two, keep up with. So um, I, I guess that the, the tone of the letter was, um, how are parents to, to work? How are they supposed to work? How are they supposed to parent? And how are they, they supposed to be a full-time teacher and stay calm and be that sounding board and, yeah. and that shield for their children, um, be loving, be patient, be kind, and, and help them to feel like things are okay right now in such uncertain times. So if our stress levels, if we're maxed out, and we're yeah. at max capacity, that means a shorter fuse for our little ones. And it also means... Um, not being able to convey though our words may convey it certainly our, our emotions are feeling they're feeling the stress that's coming from us as well because also you're trying to create a safe space at home in the during the pandemic and the lockdown Absolutely. and then they need you to yeah. be mum and dad now probably more right. than ever before yeah and you're having to manage exactly. this other role where you're you're the kind of teacher too yes that's exactly right so it was really just, hey, here's some food for thought. I'd love any suggestions yeah. or feedback that you have was the tone of the letter. But essentially, this isn't working for us. And I would imagine it's not working for others. What can we do sure uh, collectively right. to come up with some better solutions? Yeah. And you're right. I mean, if, if the attitude about, I don't know this particular school board, but if, they're, if the attitude that's coming across is that they expect it to be business as usual, but you just have to conduct the business at home, it, it seems to be... At the very least insensitive doesn't it to the real pressures that you're facing and the it fact does that the whole world yeah. is changing around around us at the moment yeah it is that's that's exactly right it's right i want to come back to the solution in a minute but i mean do you, what's what's this making you think about education generally i mean do you, there's a kind of assumption isn't it whenever this pandemic is over that we go back to business as usual i mean but it sounds, you know, from everything you've been saying, that you've got some pretty strong reservations about business as usual anyway, you know, with or without the pandemic. I mean, do you feel that you're finding things out here, particularly through the work with your sister, about the way the system as a whole ought to, ought to start to shift? Well, you know, I, I read an article just recently this week where a woman said, um, she was kind of lamenting about people, how how individual so many individuals are referring to this as homeschooling yeah. and she's a long time public school teacher as well as as someone that actually homeschools her children right now currently mm -hmm. um and she said having seen both sides she said this let, let me make a very clear distinction and differentiation this is not homeschooling this is crisis schooling they look very different i thought that was a, an excellent way to kind of describe what's happening because i mean the next question that I would pose is how much are my children even really retaining? Is this benefiting them? I mean, they're going through the motions, they're checking the boxes, but, but this isn't an ideal learning platform for any of them. And is it just a waste of our time and a waste of our sanity, our precious sanity, right? Yeah. Um, and, during and a time where, like I said, we're supposed to be rallying together to support each other and help each other out. And help, so, get, get, help get each other through the immediate, absolutely. immediate emergency. Yeah. Um, and then, then can my I, next question, oh, I, go ahead. Can I just, so how are the kids coping with it? Um, you know, my fifth grader seems to be coping the best. And I think it's because her teachers have kind of collaboratively come up with this, this co-creation of what they felt like the kids were missing and right. what was the most detrimental to them. And they created a system around that. So they took kind of a, they went, they took out kind of a whole approach to what do our kids need? Um, emotionally and, and mentally as well as academically. And it seems to be a successful model. So she's coping the best. And I think they, it's because directly because they provided her with the most normalcy. Um, a high school student is really struggling. And uh, my, kid, my kindergartner is, is acting out beyond belief. <laughs> she's, she seems to really be, be feeling it, so. But presumably she's spending a lot of time sitting down in front of these five websites. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, she's fighting it. She doesn't yeah. enjoy it. It's, yeah, it's doing would. the opposite of what, what I want to have happen, which is it's decreasing her, her desire to learn 
she's starting to get in a really negative connotation with having to get on a laptop and do any type of learning. So if you were to remove, or rather, if you were to have the ideal situation with the school board, which allowed you to get on with the way you think, think, think things ought to be, but help the kids keep up as far as they could with, with the, the pressures that they would have in school, how would you have it? What, what, what would be the, an ideal setup? Because the last thing you presumably want is them sitting on their own in their own rooms. Right. So uh, they on, online. <laughs> that's that's exactly right. Um, you know, going back to to a solution, what was actually created, I, I believe, created by my my children's team teachers, and mm -hmm. and I, I believe if other teachers are are listening or have the opportunity to listen, this is um, a duplicatable model that that is working. It's successful, and it's working for the student and for me as a parent because, like I said, it's allowing her to work independently. And that is that they've identified that the, the five things that the children are missing are that social engagement. They're missing their friends. They suddenly got cut off from that social in, uh, interaction with their best friends. They're missing um, the ability to share their feelings and their experiences with their friends. Um, so creating relatable events or discussing relatable topics. They're missing routine. Um, they're missing that live opportunity to talk with their teachers every day and have their teachers still be teachers and answer those questions as opposed to the, the parents now turning into those teachers. And then um, they're missing a lot of clear and articulate assignments with, with some coinciding, coinciding um, uh, realistic timelines. And so they've created a system where my daughter gets on with her German teacher in her German class from nine to 10 every single morning, five days a week. The class engages, it's a Zoom call, so they all see each other, they laugh at the, at the, the beginning of their call. Um, they all talk about their feelings, what they experienced their week, that week, if there were fears, how they coped with them, how they dealt with them. And then um, they have a moment to catch up as friends. And then the teacher allows them to ask any questions at that time relating to the assignments that they posted so that they're able, the teachers are able to get all that out of the way so the that the students are then very clear on that particular assignment. And then, then when they post those assignments, like I said, they're, they're very um, intentional about their text so that the, that the children, there's no room for misunderstanding yeah. and their timelines are realistic. They're, in fact, they're, they're her workload has significantly lessened. And I think that's the best way to get through this with the little, she then follows from 10 to 11, the exact same routine with her language arts teacher. And she's, she's done with her homework and with her schooling in three hours every day and doesn't feel overwhelmed. She yeah. feels, I, she's, she's coping better than any of my other children. And yeah. that's a model that I think is successful, that's working. And what, what's the kindergarten teacher recommending? Um, I mean, it, uh, you say about the five websites, it, has, has the school moved on from that? Or is that, is that still the, what they're expecting? That's still what, we're, that's still what they're expecting. That's still what we're doing. Um, she did have a Zoom call with all the students last week, which was great. Mm -hmm. um, for a few minutes, all the littles were able to get on and, and um, see each other and wave and say hello. And then they all got to talk about what they were doing um, in their spare time, which we're doing all sorts of fun, engaging things. And the thing she chose to say was, I just watch a lot of movies. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, oh, shame, shame entered stage left. But that anyway, they'll, they'll say what they're going to say. But um, you can depend she, on your kids to do this, can't you? <laughs> Right. <laughs> but I think that I, I, you know, I don't even, I, I'm not even saying that I have answers for kindergartners other than if they could, they could again, follow some sort of similar routine where it's the same time every morning they're getting on with their class. Maybe they're doing their regular, um, you know, repetition is really important at that age when they're learning their letters and, and their sounds and they're doing their reading and, so, you know, I think if they could get on regularly and have that interaction, see the other students and then have that, that nice repetition every day. I, I think the most important thing for kindergartners right now is just reading. If, I, don't, I think you could do away with all the online everything and just make sure you're reading with your children every day and they're doing their reading. So I also think there's a lot of unnecessary activities that are being 
implemented just for the sake of I've got to keep these kids busy, and also which in turn is keeping the parents busy. Well, that's right. And, and at the end of this, you want them to come out, don't you, being more interested in learning, more excited about it, and not less like the, like the kids and the scientists' coats. You don't want them to come out right. of this lockdown feeling right. that they're being turned off school altogether. And also, there's all the other stuff that you need to take care of as a family, isn't it? You need time together and you need the time to play and relax and, and, and to fill all those other roles that, that, you know, as a mum and a dad, you need to. Yes, that, yeah, that's exactly right. What, what are you doing over things like physical exercise? Um, we are, Utah is beautiful. So we've been able to get out and go on a lot of hikes. There's, there's um, ample, ample opportunity for um, getting outdoors here. So we've been able to respect that distancing, but also get out and get a little bit of exercise or we'll go down to just an open field and, and you know, play some lacrosse or kick a soccer ball around, throw a football. Yeah. So that, that's, that's been good to get them out and get, is, the weather's been fairly decent here. So get some vitamin D and raise yeah. their spirits a little that way. Is lacrosse a thing in Utah? Uh, it is. Yeah. My son, my son really loves it. It's, we've had a hard time getting it sanctioned in his school, but, but well. it's a sport that he yeah. loves. Yeah. I've never, I don't think I've ever been to a game, but it looks, looks pretty harsh as a game. It, it's the one with the, like the hockey sticks with nets on the end. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Right. It's actually my favorite sport to watch. It's very entertaining to watch. Send me to a baseball game and I'm like, please make this end. Yes. But, but lacrosse is, you know, I, I lived in America. I lived in Los Angeles for nearly 20 years. We just came back a few weeks ago. Oh, you did? Next, okay. Next our daughter, yeah. And I went to one baseball game, uh, the, the Dodgers. And I sat there for three hours and nothing happened <laughs> at all. Oh, and, and I, I realized know. at the end of it that that's the point. Nothing's meant to happen. The whole point <laughs> is to stop things happening, isn't it? But I, you know, I, have to, uh, I have to back off on this because the British also invented cricket. Where oh, right. a game that can go on for five days and at the end of which nobody, <laughs> nobody won. And I <laughs> and people stop for lunch in the middle. So <laughs> you know, there's an American ambassador to London, I can't remember his name now, but years ago he was he published a memoir about his time in London. And one one of his responsibilities was to attend the they're called test matches. It's a bit like the World Series, you know, but the these five day games of cricket, international games. And he said, it wasn't until I took part, I, I attended a five-day cricket match, that I fully grasped the concept of eternity. <laughs> That's that. an excellent way to say it. it yeah. I got a glimpse of that <laughs> after three hours of watching a baseball game. With your baseball? Yeah. <laughs> I've been a baseball mom. It's, yeah. it's rough. Yeah. <laughs> well, lacrosse, you don't get time to get bored, do you? Because that, that ball comes no. around, doesn't it? High speed. Yeah, there's movement the whole time. There's action the yeah. whole time. It's engaging. So what, what are you doing, Natalie, for you? Because in the middle of all this, you're working, you're looking after the family, you're trying to keep things going, you're trying to deal with the school board, <laughs> you know, and all those pressures. I mean, <laughs> part, part of it has got to be, hasn't it, to change the game, the game plan here with the school board and to get them to think differently. But, but are you able to give yourself any time? How, how are you uh, taking care of yourself? You know, I... I... No... <laughs> the best way to say that is just no I in fact I'm I'm struggling with with understanding just the, the very question that you asked you know the very topic of this of this podcast is understanding your role as a parent during this learning from home time um, it's it's this balancing act that I feel like I'm I'm certainly failing at and even though I've lowered my expectations they're still expectations and trying to understand it all feels like a top priority and if everything's a top priority then nothing is yeah. um so you know I, I i don't believe i'm making any time for myself because uh it's it's definitely by the time the the day is done there's there's no energy left i just fall into bed it's yeah. I'm, I'm surviving i'm i'm crisis schooling <laughs> yeah that's, that's is a what great I'm doing time right for it, isn't it? do you do you get the kids to work with each other and to support each other? Uh, you know, not probably not as well as I, I should. I, that's an interesting question, and I like that question. And it's it's thought provoking because probably not as as well as I could. I think I always think that's a big.
problem in conventional schooling that that children are educated by age group <clears throat> on this conveyor belt system. Yeah. And as you said right at the beginning, we tend to underestimate what they're capable of. Um, you know, and there's a lot to be said, isn't there, for helping them teach each other, learn from each other, because they're at different stages in the system. And it may well be, you know, that they'd get some pleasure. They certainly have a lot to offer each other in the way sure, of, yeah. you know, and, and I say there are, there are four of them. Just, just a thought, you know. That's a great thought. Yeah. I appreciate that. But in the meantime, you do have to take care of yourself, don't you? I mean, it's the old maxim about putting your own mask on first, isn't it? Which has a particular resonance these days, but it was always the case that if, if you're, you're getting burnt out with the pressure of it all, as you say, it, it starts to convey itself one way or another, doesn't it? Sure. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. And, and that is definitely something I'm, I'm, I'm falling short on because it, it almost feels like from the moment we wake up, we're in triage mode where we are just yeah. stomping out one, one, we're very reactive. We're stomping out one fire after another. And um, it's, and I don't think any, anyone thrives incredibly well in, in 100% reactive no. um, in that space. And the thing is, this particular pressure, as we said earlier, is, it's all enveloped in this larger uncertainty about just what's going on. Sure. You know, with the economies in free fall and people losing jobs and all, all the other worries that come along with it, you know, to, to be pitched. It's why we started this, because you know, it's really important to hear from, from people who are having to handle it. And it's like every family in the country at the moment, in the world. But we're also going to be talking to people who've got some longer experience of having to, being able to do it. And I think this particular issue about um, how you keep your own, you know, put your own mask on first, you know, how not just parents, but everybody takes care of their own mental health in this sort of situation, because there are immense pressures. I mean, do you have any, you don't have to have, but for other people who are coping, I mean, what, what are the sorts of things that have, um, in terms of the, the way the system's currently working, I mean, you're, you're in this situation of, of creating a new school with your sister. Um, I mean, my sense of it is you, you really don't care for, well, it's not a sense that you actually said it, you know, for business as usual. But what, what do you think you'll take away from all of this once, once things do at least start to move again? In well, it's made me... Education. Sure. It's made me really curious um, about how much my children are really getting out of, of this type of online schooling. Um, my husband works in the e-learning management space, and I know that's a question they ask themselves all the time is, is how do you measure or determine mastery uh, and assessment? You know, mastery meaning are they learning the content that, that we've assigned and an assessment meaning and how do we test for that? Mm -hmm. What's the best way to test for it? Um, so, you know, in, in thinking about that and, and if this is potentially, I mean, you talk about in your book, the element you talk about, you know, schools kind of being the dinosaur and, and I mean, and at some point things have to change, right? We have to evolve. There has to be some sort of evolution. Mm -hmm. And this, if this is potentially a catapult, into possible change, possible evolution in the future. Um, what does that look like? How do we, you know, and, and with things going, um, with being, things being so technical, I would imagine a lot of this could potentially move online from a corporate standpoint and a schooling standpoint. So um, a lot of my questions would be around for myself, for my curriculum that, that and the, and the, uh, business that we're building as well as just futuristic thinking in terms of education and, and corporations as a whole. Um, what, what needs to happen to make this type of platform or similar platforms more successful mm -hmm. um, from a retention standpoint, from an engagement standpoint? Um, and, and do we have, I mean, are there statistics around that? So that's would probably be a, a question that I'm that ruminates yeah. quite often. Yeah. It's also clear, isn't it, through all of this, that you know, there are fantastic benefits online. Sure. Wonderful resources, wonderful apps, all kinds of ways that online learning can help. But it's by no means the whole answer. There's, there's still 
um, it's still very important to encourage a balance between being online and being offline, which is certainly why you're off hiking and doing lacrosse, isn't it? There are, <laughs> I mean, just a final question. How do you handle that? Are, are you, um, are, are you introducing kind of new protocols with your children about how and when they're online? Because left to their own devices, like most adults, they'll be online all day. I mean, I'm as guilty of that as everybody. Sure. So prior to that, we had um, a two hour limitation every day, um, which even pushed which was even longer than I'd like. But my son also participates in um, a, a gaming club at school, which mm -hmm. I recently found out you can get scholarships for this. Oh, so wow. he's one of the starters for some <laughs> gaming that he does on school. Um, but yeah, historically, too much electronic time. I, I, I fight that battle a lot. And now I'm, I'm saying, all right, from the, from the moment you wake up until 4 p.m. every day, you guys run electronics, which then makes me just inherently want to dial back from any other electronics. But then my son feels you know, gypped because he looks forward to that game time that he gets yeah. in his practice time with his buddies. And so it does feel like it's, it's, the electronics are a little too much. So yeah. um, I, I'm that that's an issue I'm not exactly sure how to address because it does feel like the electronic time is just too much for us. And I'm not sure how how to dial that back and still complete get all their schoolwork accomplished and then allow them that time to play. Um, so we do try to encourage at least one outdoor activity every day to put unplug, step yeah. outside. Um, kind of disengage and be in the present for a moment. But again, um, just the balancing act is, is fairly excruciating <laughs> trying yeah. to juggle. Them. Well, I think that's a lesson from all of this, isn't it? Right? We've got to come out of this uh, with some genuine benefits from having been forced to rethink the way things are being done at the moment. And, uh, and I feel that very strongly, you know, it's just not right to tip everything into your in-tray as a, as a family. And expect you to do everything else, you know, and, and also to keep that nourishing relationship as a family thriving, which is really what of everything else, what the kids need, isn't it? That's exactly what they need, yes. Well, Natalie, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate You're it. You're so welcome. And you know, I, I hope you listen to the series. You know, you can have all kinds of you know interesting voices and, and advice as well on all these things. So, but it, it's just been great to talk to you. Yeah, you as well. Absolutely. I, I look forward to the series coming out. Very good. Thanks so much. Okay. Good luck. Thank you for your time. Good luck. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Take care.